spend some time sharing with you all uh, this afternoon. I'm just going to set myself a little timer to try and make sure that I don't go over time as well. And actually, that's an indication of the sort of things that I try to do, really, because just using simple technology is often the best way to do it. Um, and so I'm looking at evidence-informed uses of EdTech to help get online learning right uh, during the session. Now, I uh, taught for many years, um, and uh, there were lots of things I was doing in my career, uh, which led to me being asked to go out and share with schools and do different things. Uh, I was already blogging, and um, I'd written a book, and so forth and so on. I was asked to become an independent thinking associate and I sort of did the work with a few companies like Apple and Microsoft and Google and, and all these sort of things and it led me into a position where I was able to get out and share uh, and do things and uh, spend more time with my children which is always nice uh, so I've been doing this for um, five years now I've just started my sixth year uh, of doing the work that I'm doing now and uh, it's a real privilege to get to travel the world uh, and all over the country and work with loads of fantastic schools and educators supporting them with teaching and learning with uh, or without technology. Uh, so I've, I've written a whole bunch of books and I've uh, contributed to, to a few as well. Uh, some of those you saw just there such as my perfect RCT every lesson book and uh, the big book of independent thinking and some guides to digital strategies all these sort of things um, but um, I got into the business of education to help make a difference and that sort of guides me with what I do. So please do, uh, in the course of the afternoon, just drop the hashtag AskICTEvangelist ask and I'm very happy to follow up afterwards as I mentioned before. When it comes to, to technology use, uh, Arthur Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And this is a fantastic quote because I, I, I work with teachers and oh my goodness, oh my God, that's, it's amazing. But it actually, a lot of the things that we want to try and do with technology aren't actually that difficult. But if we don't know how it works or uh, anything like that, um, it can be seen as being some, somewhat magical. During the course of the afternoon, I'm going to try and share five things with you that aren't really that magical, are quite easy, and hopefully good takeaways that you can use to help and support you with what you do in the classroom. But the thing is, with technology, when, when, when things are seen as being a bit magical, actually it can be recognisable as something which is a bit gimmicky. And I see lots of teachers doing uh, using uh, virtual reality, and that's not to say virtual reality in and of itself is, is gimmicky, um, but there, there's a lot of technology which has got a propensity to be gimmicky and not be informed by learning. Uh, and and doesn't really support your teaching and actually students see right through this you don't want to be seen as uh, an easy teacher to, uh, to get away with doing any work actually you know, learning is hard and um, we'll be talking about these sort of things during the course of the session today um, so when it comes to thinking about using technology in the classroom I'm always an advocate for having a healthy dose of so what just because you can do something with technology doesn't mean necessarily that you should do something with technology so it's really important, I think, to just ask yourself some simple questions. And once you've asked the so what, then how, turn that around into a so that. So I may be thinking about using product X. I will use OneNote Class Notebook, Google Classroom, Zoom, whatever it is. So that. And if you can have that so that moment, that helps give you much more purposeful uses of your technology. And it's not a big thing. It's not a... Uh, uh, a light bulb moment it might be for some of you but it, it should be something you know we, we do choose to use technology so that it can have impactful reasons and like banana rama said in the 80s it's not what you do it's the way that you do it that's really important as well and so i i, I was hosting a show yesterday with um, a friend of mine ollie lewis and then we had a presenter on there who's a head of science at a school in Muscat. And he was showing some really amazing ways informed by uh, cognitive science about how he's using PowerPoint. And we're sharing some similar ideas during the presentation today. But it's PowerPoint. It's not, you know, the most groundbreaking, super sexy, woohoo technology in the world ever. But it can make a big difference and have an impact on learning in the classroom. And so it's these sorts of things and these sorts of principles that I'm going to share with you. People often know me for these sorts of things. You know, when I share resources such as these periodic tables of apps and, and all of these. But the thing is, if you haven't started looking at this as a resource, people say lovely things about it, they look nice, all the rest of it. But just because you can access all of these 82 different apps to use in the classroom, again, doesn't necessarily mean that you should. And, and often technology, and this is something which is backed up by a report from the Education Endowment Foundation that I'll share later. Um, but just because you can use the technology doesn't mean that you should, like I said. 
And often technology can be a, a solution in search of a problem. And actually, if we, if we start with what we're trying to achieve in the classroom um, and then move it forwards, we're much more likely to have an impact uh, on learning if we're using our technology for purposeful reasons linked to helping us with what we're doing as education professionals. And this, car this cartoon, a friend of mine, Steve Banbury, spotted this. Uh, and this really sort of resonates with me because if, if, you're, if you are using these sorts of resources like I make and, and others, uh, and just using it as a place to just go and find apps to find something fun um, engagement is is important it's a, it's a byproduct of good teaching and learning I think as Carl Hendricks said it's a poor proxy for learning and so you know, using technology in purposeful ways is really really important um, I don't just share apps I make other resources like this one and I've actually read all of these books just to, just to say I, I do do some professional reading professional learning myself as well um, and I think it's really important as professionals that we do do these sorts of things to help us uh, move on and develop our practice um, but don't just take my word for it about all these different things you know people like Dame Alison Peacock and the Chartered College of Teaching you know they, they, they see the propensity in the um, opportunity that using technology can bring to uh, support and enhance and develop teaching and learning um, but without doing it for purposeful reasons again it links back to the idea of gimmickry and what have you um, what I'm sharing with you today is a whistle-stop version of things I often do on insets with schools. I'm just going to share some quick feedback with you uh, from some teachers that uh, share things on Twitter after events. So here's Corrine from a school uh, in uh, Spain. We have some nice feedback here from a school in Bristol. Uh, we've got another one here from uh, the Big Cabot Learning Federation in Bristol. And we've got Yolanda from Madrid. Uh, International College Spain. We've got Dee Saran from Dubai College. So I'm hoping that you I've mentioned gimmicky types of things, but I'm hoping from the things I'm sharing with you up front is showing you and sharing with you that there are some great things that you can do when it comes to using technology, uh, which can actually be impactful and evidence informed. So starting with a bit of research, um, the uh, learning scientists have written uh, this, this book, it's a few years old now. And but in there, uh, they share a, a few key things. And what I'm going to share with you now are the sort of the, the various ideas that are underpinning the ideas I'm going to share with you um, during the course of the session. So they've talked about things like retrieval practice, uh, so forth and so on. And these are great. And their website is a fantastic resource as well. If you want to sort of Google the learning scientists, you'll find lots of information about all these different things. Uh, they talk about both in, this, both in this fantastic book and on their site. And there are loads of resources on their site which are really helpful. The Education Endowment Foundation have done lots of research into what works as well. And this isn't just about what works with the technology, although they have done that. They've got lots of fantastic reports, uh, one of which um, is based on a teaching and learning toolkit. And in here we can see really clearly um, that the things that have the most impact uh, for the least amount of um, effort and money and what have you um, is, is feedback and metacognition and self-regulation. So the things I'm sharing with you here are the things that are going to inform the ideas I'm going to share with you during the course of the session today. Back um, just over a year ago, the Education Endowment Foundation released this report, which um, sort of gives you, uh, this is just a summary of the report, and um, it gives some really clear guidance into things that work when it comes to you know, using and embedding technology uh, in education. And, and the first thing they talk about, which to me seems like really like a, like a no-brainer, but um, <clears throat> schools still now say, you know, we're looking, to, we've just bought 100 X devices, what do we do with them? And that's the wrong way around. We should be thinking and considering how technology can be improving the teaching and learning before you actually introduce it. I know how sometimes you might have a bit of budget left at the end of the year and you want to actually buy something um, and, and, and how that sort of thing can happen. Um, but it's really important if you want to make the most out of your investments, um, just like you know, um, we have performance management for us as teachers, we should be expecting a, a return on the uh, um, <clears throat> investment in technology as well. But they say technology can be used to improve the quality of explanations and modeling. They talk about how it can improve the impact of people practice and how it can improve assessment and feedback. And so there are lots of different things we know about what works with teaching and learning that we can actually apply to our uses of technology in the classroom. I break this down into sort of three key areas to make it really nice and simple. Ask yourself these questions. Does this technology enhance learning or does it support my teaching? 
or does it speed up the processes? Because um, you know, Michael Fullan talks about having pedagogy first approaches to using technology, but sometimes actually just having access to something which makes our lives quicker and easier, automating some processes, these sorts of things can have really, 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 really help when it comes to what we're doing uh, in the classroom. So what can we actually do? What can we uh, do with all of these things that we've been thinking about from here and the learning scientists and so forth and so on? Well, if you want to improve the quality of explanations and modeling, there are some really simple things Things we can do uh, with um, things like PowerPoint and Keynote and what have you. This is um, Keynote that I'm using, um, but you can you can do similar things to what I'm going to share with you now um, using PowerPoint. So as professionals, if we think about a feedback loop, the feedback loop is where a student would then hand some work to us, however, digitally or in, by hand if we we're back in school, to us the teacher. We then give that back to them. And that enables us to have regular and specific improvement points so that learning is informed. Um, teaching is adapted based upon student responses so that, you can see I'm a so that sort of person, can't you? That's from Zoe Elder, full on learning. Her book is amazing. I'm very lucky to have her as a colleague for many years. But there are a few things going on here. Right? The first thing is, okay, now if I was delivering this in class, okay, and talking to students about this, and again, a great thing to have that sort of conversation about metacognition and all of this, but if I was having some class, putting all of this on the slide at the same time isn't really helpful to my explanation. Okay, and by putting in some very, very simple animations onto my slide, it draws your attention to the right thing at the right time. So I was talking with a friend um, who I believe is a guest here today, Emma Bell, um, and, she, and she's a, a maths teacher. And so I, I inc I've included a maths example about how this would work. Now, I, I, I completely stole this from the resource online, mathlearning.com, uh, to serve as the example. Now, if I'm a math teacher and using, and this is in, in relation to online learning as well, if I'm wanting to ask this question and explain it, um, would I put all of these things on the screen at the same time and then work my way through to this bit here and show all of this? Is that going to help me work through these various steps with my learners to help them understand how to break down that question and, and come up with a solution at the end? No, it's not. But what I can do, what is better, is to actually do that slowly using some simple animations. So the first thing I do, Peter can mow the lawn in 40 minutes and John can mow the lawn in so forth and so on. How long will it take for them to mow the lawn together? So now what I can do is say, well, the first thing we need to do is assign the variables. Okay, so let's make the X is the, is the time to mow the lawn together. And then let's use a formula. And the formula would look something like this. 1 over 40 plus 1 over 60. That would then be equal to 1 over X. Now from this, we can then, and this is where I've put my slides in the wrong order, which isn't very helpful. See, best laid planned, ladies and gentlemen. Now how has that got into there? That's very, very strange. I do apologize. Let's imagine, I've gone to there, I've gone to there. Better is two though. I do apologize, ladies and gentlemen. I seem to have managed to have deleted a complete slide. Well, there you go. Just to go to prove that everyone can make mistakes using technology. I do do a session on growth mindset with technology for when things go wrong. So this is a perfect example of growth mindset where things go wrong. Thank you ever so much for your forbearance. Hopefully, though, you've got the idea from what I'm sharing with you from this per first part here. What I did was on the other slide was to then break these down so I could then talk through each of these different points here so that it explained it at the point it was supposed to be explained. Now, the reason why I'm sharing this as an example with you is because, you know, if we were in a classroom, we might sort of write these things on the board as we're doing our explanations and so forth and so on, but we don't have as much easy access to these sorts of things when we're doing things remotely from home, if we're recording our screen, using a screen recorder, or if we're presenting like I am here in Zoom. Um, if, you've, if you're lucky enough to have a device such as a Surface, which has got a touch screen for you to write on, then that's really, really helpful. But often, most of us don't have access to those different things. So the point of what I'm trying to share with you on this one is that by using these simple animations, that when you click through them, you get these sorts of effects like I was showing you uh, on this slide here. Um, so we work through and we talk through all the different points like we've got here. If you can do that with the things that you're trying to explain, then that's much, much, much more helpful uh, to teaching and learning and helps you far more easily with your explanations. Uh, this one here is quite a complicated one, actually. This was developed by um, uh, uh, an Irish teacher 
uh, Jan Hughes. Um, he's used the line draw animation uh, uh, in Keynote to try and explain what's going on here through this little animation. You can get really, really deeply into it, but actually, one thing I do share as well is if it's going to take you longer to prepare something for a lesson than the lesson actually takes, and I must have taken him a very long time to make that. If it's going to take you longer to prepare a lesson with technology than it otherwise would, maybe consider don't actually doing that. That's not to say that what he hasn't done, he's done here isn't, isn't good, it's really valuable, but it's important that we have some work life balance of what we do, and technology should serve us rather than drive us to do things which take up too much, uh, too much time. The second thing I wanted to share with you is the bit about improving the impact of pupil practice. Now, many of you will be aware of things like Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve, and uh, because it's really in public, uh, the public's consciousness now, or the teacher's consciousness, I'm not going to spend time going through all of this. Okay, um, but the premise is is that if I teach something today and we don't revisit it for a, a, a significant period of time, then we don't remember very much of it in you know, 60 days time. But if we revisit it in three days and then 10 days and so forth and so on, uh, it's a fantastic way to uh, really improve the chance of remembering those things. So there are great assessment for learning tools that can support this idea of retrieval practice, which is tied into Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve. There are lots that I use. Um, quizzes is my absolute favourite, and I'll talk more about that one in just a moment. But if you haven't got quizzes, there are lots of other tools available. If you're a Microsoft school, for example, you can use things like Microsoft Forms. If you're a Google school, you can use Google Forms. You've got tools like Kahoot, um, which has moved its uh, platform on massively in the last sort of year or two uh, to, to make it much more easy to support things like retrieval practice and remove that gamification element if you want to. Quizlet again is, is, is superb for these sorts of things. So some really great ways that you can support students in improving their pupil practice. Um, quizzes is very easy to set up. Um, it shares easily if you're a Google or a Microsoft school. You can easily share things that you've made in there into those two different platforms. Uh, it marks things for you. You can set stuff as assignments. You can feed the results into your student work page uh, if you're using Google Classroom. Uh, and, and again, it links really, really closely and well into retrieval practice. And it's super easy uh, to make quizzes. There are lots of different options um, which will auto mark. The open ended ones don't auto mark, but all the others uh, will. Um, fantastic question types there. Uh, as I said, it links through to things such as Google Classroom um, and Microsoft Teams. Uh, really, really powerful. You've got some superpowers and there's some really great accessibility options in there as well to have questions read aloud. Uh, you can use memes to um, sort of reward students or give them an indicator afterwards, which I think is a lovely little sort of touching base feature actually when you haven't got so much face-to-face -face time uh, with your learners uh, if you're working remotely. It gives you great statistics afterwards uh, as to how different people have got on with the questions. Um, you can have a feature, you can use a feature in there called the redemption question feature as well. Uh, so with that, um, children get a chance to have a go at answering the question again. Um, but the best feature of all for me is the one that's called the teleport feature. It is fantastic. It's a bit like for me, the minority report. Uh, um, film with Tom Cruise. If you imagine when he's there in front of that screen, pulling a thing from there and pulling a thing from there and pulling a thing from there, it's super easy. All you have to do is type what you're sort of working, uh, searching for at the top here. Lots of diff different quizzes appear on this side. Questions appear here, and all you have to do is just sort of do the plus sign here, plus sign, and just choose the questions you want, and it drops them straight into your quiz, really, really quickly, really, really easily. As with any of these tools though, a health warning, uh, please do check if you're using someone else's questions that they actually got their own question correct in their answers. Nothing worse than setting the quiz for your students and then you getting the actual question wrong yourself in the quiz that you set then. So um, due diligence, I don't work for quizzes. I'm not on any sort of commission for recommending them. For me, it's probably uh, just the best tool, uh, I think, uh, for, for this sort of activity uh, in the classroom. I want to put some time talking about dual coding now. People often say to me, uh, Mark, your slides are so pretty when you actually get them to work properly and I don't delete the, other, the slide by mistake, obviously. Um, but there are um, fantastic ways that we can take on board some of the ideas of dual coding to make our resources and our, our um, slides and things we make for our, our learners, uh, worksheets and what have you, uh, work far more better. Uh, so what is dual coding? 
if you're looking for a good place to start and there's a um, fantastic um, course by Seneca um, uh, from uh, Oliver Caviglioli uh, which you can access to find out more and, and, and uh, one of them, but his, his book is a great reckoner uh, with loads of fantastic information in there to help you get started um, but essentially um, dual coding is something which was first um, sort of discussed by Alan Paper back in 71 and it postulates that both visual and verbal information is used to represent information it hits sort of two different uh, centers in your brain and so having that dual coding going on uh, can support and enhance and help teaching and learning. So uh, how can you do this? Well, there are lots of resources that we make as teachers where we can take on board this sort of thinking to help us with what, what we actually do. And I've got some examples to share with you after this as well. So it could be a diagram showing multiple elements. It could be an infographic or a timeline or uh, an annotated chart analysis. There are lots and lots of ways that we can uh, sort of take on board the ideas of dual coding and utilize it in our teaching and in their learning, uh, there being students. So key things to remember, it's not about drawing or being good at drawing. Um, you try and keep some good space between the different things that you bring together. So spatial qualities uh, are important and they allow a meaning to be created. Uh, the layout of your page is very important. Something you'll find if you look in uh, Oliver's book is he's got lots of great layouts to help you uh, sort of map out your slides and your resources and, and the things that you're doing. Uh, try and avoid photographs if possible. There's lots of visual information in the photograph. Icons, and I've got some resources. Uh, they've got some fantastic free uh, icons and things to share with you in a second as well. Um, and don't use lots of decorative images such as clip art unless it actually is impactful and linked to what it is you're trying to show and share. So what does that look like in the classroom? Well, this is an example on paper. Uh, this is shared by a teacher from America, Blake Harvard, and there's a link to his um, uh, blog where this was discussed um, at the bottom there. And you can find, follow him on Twitter at Effortful Educator. Um, it's a bit of a funky spelling there. So if you do miss it, I, I'm happy to uh, ping that back to you um, in the uh, chat or Twitter afterwards. What does it look like? Well, I can zoom in a little bit and show you. And, you know, so we've got the, the writings really clear. He's, he's putting some lovely little, this is a student's work as well, uh, putting some things around to make it really clear what's going on, uh, using some images to represent um, what's going on. Uh, so iconic, you've got a little eye, you've got echoic, you've got a little ear, so forth and so on. This is a fantastic, you know, real life example of how a student in a real class is applying the thinking around dual coding um, into what they're doing in the classroom. And this is fantastic as well on a metacognitive level as well, because it's the students clearly understanding that doing this is actually going to help them remember and learn and applying that to what they're doing in the classroom. That's a fantastic thing to have. If you've got students who are that mindful of these things uh, whilst they're working and doing their things with you uh, in their learning, then that's a fantastic place to be with your students. So that's the example from Blake. And here's an example from me. And many of you see these sorts of infographics that I make and share on social media. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to embed not just the dual coding stuff here, but also doing the explanation thing, like I showed before about improving the quality of explanations. Because by doing things simply, I'm using the spatial qualities, I'm using related images, uh, I'm using the animations, and I'm able to talk through the infographic now so that it is really clear what I'm talking about when I'm talking about it. So Twitter for professional education, uh, professional learning and education, there are lots of benefits. It brings you um, information about the latest research, the latest thinking, um, and um, it is really, really supportive and helpful there. It enables you to get involved in online events, such as the one that we're involved in right now. How many of you learned about this from an email, or how many of you learned about this from a tweet that was put out by myself or Flavor or Seneca? Okay, so it's a fantastic place to get involved in these sorts of things. It's a great way to connect and share lots of my you know um, I, I live by myself and actually using uh, social media has been superb for me in terms of connecting with people during lockdown um, I held a, uh, an online quiz last week uh, for example in, in a live stream which brought lots of teachers uh, to have a bit of fun on, on Thursday evening and it also gives you opportunity for things like cross-school collaboration so what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm, I'm trying to show you by doing really so in, in here i've got a whole bunch of things that are helping me to explain this more clearly to you i've got dual coding i've got the animations i'm doing the explanations so forth and so on and it is just a presentation tool it's just you know um um keynote we can do that in lots of ways where do i get my icons from well there's a great site called the noun project uh, where there are icons for everything as i say just there 
Um, sometimes you do want to use images as well and, and I worry about teachers who use Google Images because that's not a great place to go um, because often the images are copyright. So places like Unsplash for example or um, and I've done the Nine Project twice for some reason. Uh, but uh, Pixabay again is another fantastic site with lots of images um, and um, icons and, and other uh, visual things to help you, uh, vector graphics uh, and they're all um, again uh, copyright license free so you can use those. A site that I really like as well, which is a, an AI project from Google, is autodraw.com. Autodraw, you can simply, and you can even do this on your phone because you can use your finger on the browser. You start to draw the icon that you want to actually use, and it tries to guess what the icon is you want, and then you'll see icons uh, start to appear across the top here, and you then just click on it, choose it, and you can just, just uh, copy it and paste it into uh, the presentation or the resource that you're trying to make. And there are fantastic images there which can be used for all sorts of things. Uh, it could be a writing prompt, you know, so is that girl already there? Is it all these sorts of things? There are loads of fantastic uh, images there that you can use uh, for free. Uh, self regulation is really important. Um, I, is, is it a posh word now for discipline? But when I was told, when I was at school, it was like, you know, you need to keep yourself focused. But what can we do? Well, technology can really, really help. And lots of different platforms have uh, Android and iOS and so forth and so on have great tools to help with those sort of things. So, for example, screen time, keeping a track on how many, how much time you spend on your apps is a great way of helping both us as adults and also our learners um, be a bit more mindful about the tools they're using and how long they're spending on them. Using your calendar to organize things, and this links into the next one, which is the do not disturb function. You'll notice on a do not disturb function, um, it's, it's pulling something through, it knows that there's a meeting at a particular time, so do not disturb until this meeting is finished. All these different tools start to sing and work together and can be massively helpful in regulating what we're doing. People often say there's, there's lots of research which shows um, that using technology doesn't help things like note taking. And there was a, uh, a research report from a few years ago into university students and their notes, and they found that note taking on their laptops didn't improve learning and didn't support um, what they were trying to do with, with um, the quality of their notes. But they had other things open. They've been, they were allowing themselves, these students, to be distracted by things like Instagram, Snapchat, and so forth and so on. They weren't focused on the actual learning activity. Using technology to help you self-regulate is a great way to actually make an impact uh, with what it is you're trying to achieve. And then finally, five, improving assessment and feedback. Uh, there are lots of different tools out there that can help us uh, improve our assessment and feedback. Um, and I'm sure many of you are using these uh, whilst you've been under lockdown. Things like Seesaw are really popular in primary. Um, Office Lens is a great, great, great tool for taking snapshots of work and it crops it down, which you can then use inside things like OneNote Class Notebook and um, annotate it. Uh, Shobi have uh, similar functionality. OneNote Class Notebook itself is also brilliant. And using things like Flipgrid for getting peer feedback are also really, really powerful. One of the great things about all of these tools, though, is the fact that you can use things like your voice. So I've seen some fantastic examples of, of students submitting work in things like OneNote Class Notebook and Shobi and Seesaw. And then the teachers are able to annotate those, and, but then record their voice over it. And imagine you know, if I'm giving some feedback and I spend one minute on that feedback, what is the quality of that feedback going to be like in a minute of audio or in a minute of me sitting there and actually handwriting? And which of those two is going to be more accessible? Which one of those is going to be more impactful on my learners? For me, obviously, I'm advocating we use our voice an awful lot more. And it can improve and, and increase and improve those, those processes that we have in our classroom. So OneNote and uh, Class Notebook are fantastic. There's loads of great things we can do on there. Uh, collaboration, there's formative assessment opportunities. Uh, it's great for sharing your resources. And you can do similar things, like I said, in Shobi and in Seesaw. Office Lens, like I said, enables you to take those snapshots. Uh, you can see some examples of that just here. Uh, so there's the image and you take the photo and it crops, it recognizes the edges of the document. Now, if you're doing that in the classroom or if you've got some work uh, that you want to sort of snapshot and, and then do some work on for peer assessment, rather than trying to um, put that, um, you know, you, you can use a visualizer for this if you wanted to. But again, it's not as easy as taking a snapshot and then annotating it uh, and using that in front of the whole class. So Office Lens is a great tool. Um, I'm a big fan of it. It's free on Android and iOS and it can do lots of things. Scan documents, you can read the text. It's got the immersive reader, which you may have heard of built in, which makes it really accessible. Um, if you've got a book that you want students to read, uh, learners with reading difficulties can actually take a photograph of that and then have that text read back to them. And they can do that privately on their own devices if they want to. 
enables you to easily record the work your students have done if you've done it in an analog style. It's great for them taking their notes and photographing whiteboards, so forth and so on. And you can even use it as a pocket visualizer. So it's really, really, really powerful. Uh, so getting towards the end of the session now, so what else can we do? Well, just keep our minds on keeping it simple. Remember that thing I said at the beginning of the banana armor principle, uh, it ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. So keep things nice and simple. Keep yourself focused on whether does this tool enhance learning, will it support your teaching, will it speed up your processes? So what? Uh, so that. So I hope you found uh, the session today useful. I say I've gone through quite a lot in a very, very short space of time. Um, but as always, like I said, I don't do drive-by sessions and I'm very, very happy to take follow-up questions uh, after the session today. Uh, but for now, that's my little presentation bit over. I do apologize for the disappearing slide. I'm not quite sure where that one went to. Um, but um, hopefully the explanation was enough to give you an idea of the sorts of things you can do. So it's, uh, it's really really simple to just use animations to help your explanations i'll just uh, stop sharing my screen now and come back into here thank you very much no thank you we thank you it was really great it was very useful lots of very good tips and thanks to you uh, there are questions so uh everybody if you wanna if you think of other questions just please uh, carry on writing them on the check I remember today. Carry on, write to them on the chat, and I'll ask them to mark. So I'm going to start with the questions that have already been asked, and then uh, then we can carry on with the new ones. So a few um, questions. You mentioned uh, there are some apps that you can record screen time uh, yeah, on yeah, your yeah. phone. Uh, yeah. There are a lot of parents that are very concerned about excessive screen time. Uh, for children that they spend too yep. much time on their phones or their computers is that something that teachers should also be concerned about well it's about what sort of screen time it is actually you know and so and then the, the, the variety of, of, of apps i mean the fact that Apple brought in screen time as a feature which is standard within iOS now makes it really easy. I mean, I, I'm not going to embarrass my children by showing you their screen time. I control my own children's devices uh, yeah. with, with, with the screen time app. Um, but there are other tools, like there's one called Kirby, for example, C-U-R-B-I, uh, which parents can use uh, on Android devices to help sort of keep track of their children's uh, usage. Um, but it's, it's, it's about... I'm a huge advocate for using technology. You know, I wouldn't call myself the ICT evangelist if I, if I wasn't. However, <laughs> teaching and learning is just as important. When it comes to teaching and learning, it's just as important that students get the opportunity to do forest school or go on a field trip to London. Just because you can do a virtual tour of somewhere doesn't mean to say that you necessarily have to. You know, one of the, my, one of my favourite memories of teaching was the London. We, we used to have an activities week at the end of an academic year. And I used to love going to London with the students because it helps develop those relationships. We go and see some shows, we travel, and and it became it, it really you know, going back into the research, <clears throat> John Hattie and so forth and so on. You know, relationships are massively important between school parents and child, um, in, ter in terms of supporting them in their learning. So. You know, yes, use technology, but only be using it when it should be helpful, purposeful, yeah. you know, and, and make it just part of your teaching and learning toolkit. Just like you'll have things like um, Harkness or Socratic questioning or X, Y, Z, you know, make your professional judgment and use it as part of your teaching and learning toolkit. Don't get me wrong, love technology, but it's not always the right option. Sometimes, yeah. actually, a mini whiteboard, hold it up is quicker easier more effective than using a whole ton of technology one on a cart you've had to drag you know from another room and, and you waste time to, you know sometimes the simplest option is the best option and sometimes technology isn't that best option and it's down to us as educators mm -hmm. to a have the confidence to make that decision for ourselves uh, and, and b um do it for the right sorts of reasons yeah, technology does give us the opportunity to do things that wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the technology. That's a key tenet of a, a, a pedagogical model called SAMA uh, by Ruben Pointagira. But just because you can do that, so the redefinition stuff in SAMA, um, doesn't mean to say that substitution is a bad thing either. Again, it's, it's a bad professional judgment. Yep. And where you're at, your confidence, your competence, there, there are so many variables. Um, but, you know, like with anything, you know, don't, if you are 
you know, nervous about using technology. Don't try and do too many things at one time. I'm, I've shared a whole ton of ideas today, right? If you're like, oh my God, there's too much, my head's going to explode. That's fine. <laughs> Often people feel like that after a session with me. But I don't want you to go away and try it all at the same time. Yeah. You know, when I, when, I, when I learned to ride a bike, I didn't just get on a motorbike for, on the very first go. You know, I built myself up. I had stabilizers and, and so forth and so on. And so as a professional who's looking to get more confident with using technology, and the same is true with anything with professional development, really, is focus on that one thing and become absolutely awesome at that one particular thing and then build it up and scaffold it over time. Yeah. You know, yeah. an NQT isn't as skilled as somebody who's been teaching 10 years, and that's because they've had more practice experience, scaffolding support, they've made mistakes so forth and so on so i was quite a long answer to do a short <laughs> oh, but that's good very detailed uh but following up from there so you see that there are too many things to learn i guess if you want to learn all technologies uh so there was a comment on the chat saying that a lot of teachers won't really have the time to learn about that is there something that should be part of school policy like this is some time for you to learn about technologies how does that work yeah, no, absolutely. And the thing is, like, this is my bread and butter. So I can talk about, you know, X in, in a Google system. I can talk about Y in an in a, uh, Apple or, or an iPad sort of uh, ecosystem. Same with Microsoft. What works best in schools is keeping things simple and having a really clear, mm -hmm. consistent teaching and learning toolkit. So if you want some advice on how to make that work, I wrote um, back just before BET in January, I wrote a, a guide to creating a digital strategy uh, with Al Kingsley, who's the managing director of Netsu support and uh, uh, the uh, chair of, of, a, of a, a big mat, a multi-academy trust in Peterborough. And in there, we outline all the things you should be thinking about when it comes to developing digital in your school, not just teaching and learning, but you know, uh, safeguarding and data protection, yeah. and all these different things. But you know, keeping things nice and simple, having it a part of a toolkit, and then keeping it consistent. Not only is that really important for the teachers, but it's equally important for the students. I've worked with some schools, and I go into one classroom and a teacher's using Google Classroom, and I go into another, the next classroom next door and they're using Shobi. And I go into another classroom next door and they're using Seesaw, you know, and, and so forth and so on. Right? And students have got enough to be remembering with their academics, you know, talk about cognitive load, right? and they've got enough to be remembering with their academics without having to remember lots of different ways of just submitting work. Having a consistent approach to, um, and, and the best way to think about it is like your pencil case. You know, in your school um, uh, sort of documentation that you send home to parents, you'll have key things that you want learners to have in their pencil case a pencil, a rubber, a compass, a protractor. You don't use them all the time, but you need mm -hmm. them as part of your, your, your toolkit. Mm -hmm. the, same should be true, the same should be true of your technology. So, what is your tool for feedback? What is your tool for submitting work? so forth and so on make it really clear what those things those things are have it consistent for everybody within your school um, and spend lots of time supporting and scaffolding and training staff so they can use it well mm -hmm. is my best advice yeah um, so there's a new question now from ellen bromley asking about security issues i guess privacy issues with the user tech technology with students <laughs> Yeah, so um, that links directly really into the ecosystem that you've got, okay? Um, and so if I, you know, if I'm a, a, any new tool that you want to bring into your school and use with your learners, you need to do what's called a DPIA, which is Data Protection Impact Assessment, and find out what, what the security issues might be around it, who holds their data, is it GDPR compliance, all those sorts of things. But most schools will have one of two ecosystems. They'll either be a Google Suite for Education school um, or college, uh, or they will be a, um, a, um, a Microsoft Office 365 uh, school. And within that, there, there are um, a whole load of security things around that, which, which your technicians will set up and, and, and run for you. If you are thinking about bringing in something new, then somebody in your school will have responsibility for digital. It may be someone on school leadership. It may be uh, your network manager. Um, it depends on your school and its setup and all the rest of it. Yeah. But I would be very, very reluctant to ever recommend that somebody start using something um, with students. It's one thing you go into a site, let's say, like Pixabay, and getting an image to use as a resource or an icon from flat icon or the noun project or whatever there's a big difference between finding resources that you use within powerpoint let's say compared to opening up a whole brand new ecosystem into schools so quizzes for example is a good one you'd have to as a school and, and, and i know it's fine because i've, I've gone through a process myself but it is your duty uh, and, and, I, and I, I always share this with schools it, 
just because I've said it's okay doesn't give you carte blanche to then go say, oh, it's okay, Mark says so. You still have to go through and dot the I's and cross the T's and do the DPIA for your school. Yeah. Because the thing is, uh, someone mentioned about there being so much technology out there. There absolutely is. If any of you, if anybody's ever been to the Bet Show, I mean, it is, it is, you know, the London Excel full of different technology vendors, and it, it develops and changes daily for each of those different companies. They'll do updates all the time, and so it's incumbent upon us as professionals within our own context in our own organisation to make mm -hmm. sure that we tick all the boxes and make sure that the tools we use safeguard both us as professionals and the learners as well. How many schools, you know, if, if, we, if we'd had this conversation um, uh, four months ago and I said to you, Zoom bombing, yeah. it wouldn't have even been in our vernacular, would it? But because of the situation we're in, it became a thing. Zoom have worked really hard to improve and develop their systems to make them safe for schools and education and so forth and so on. But again, it's incumbent upon us to go in and do those checks to make sure it's all viable yeah. and, yeah. and safe. Um, okay, so there are a lot of uh, more technical questions. So I'll try to start with the, <laughs> the bigger ones. Uh, but there are questions about, uh, they asked you to explain about the Noun project a bit more. So a few people were very interested about that. They didn't know it. So if you can just talk a bit yeah, more. Yeah, of course I can. Yeah, absolutely. Can I screen share again for a second? Yeah, sure. Okay, brilliant. So the Noun Project, uh, like many uh, websites, uh, just go to here a second. And that should bring this up. And I'll just change it to the Noun uh, Project site. So on here, there are loads and loads of icons for you to use that are completely free. Another site I use as well, actually, is uh, another one called Flat Icon, uh, which, again, has lots of uh, different uh, free icons available for you to use uh, inside your pieces of work. So what you would do is you'd simply, if I just go back to the name project, because that's the site that people were asking about. Um, you type in the uh, name of the thing that you're looking to try and use in your PowerPoint presentation. So let's say I'm teaching uh, something in science and I want a uh, Bunsen burner. I'm talking about whatever it is where I need a picture of a Bunsen burner. I type in the search like this and then there's a whole bunch of different icons that you can choose from. You find the one that you want. You then have to check the license on it and, and uh, make sure that it's uh, okay for you to use, uh, which this one is, because it's got the Creative Commons license on it. So I can then just right click onto this and I can't, I need to get this icon, sorry. I'm not logged in. Once you've got the icon, you can then um, download it and use it in, in whatever uh, tool that you want to. Something I often do myself though, and I don't think it's going to screen share, Let me turn off a second. One thing to bear in mind with these sorts of things as well though, ladies and gentlemen, is that uh, Microsoft and Apple and Google are working really, really hard um, to put loads of new things into their tools uh, to support this sort of work. So if I just jump back into my keynote presentation here for a second, uh, you'll be amazed uh, at the, or, or maybe not amazed, but I was, um, at the number of amazing um, icons that are available within the set you've got here. So you've got geom geometry, uh, um, you've got other objects you can use here. I mean, it's, it's a huge library of different um, icons that you can use within inside um, uh, your, your presentation tool. And you know, whilst this is what's available on Apple, it's similarly huge in Microsoft and it's similarly huge within Google as well. What's lovely about the Google option as well, you can also search within Google Slides if you're doing it in Google. Um, uh, you can actually do a Google image search with inside Google um, Google Slides and it automatically searches by default to show you icons and photos that are already licensed for um, you to use without contravening any copyright. So if you are somebody who wants to use Google Images, okay, and you can, you can there's, a, there's a tick box inside um, Google Images when you go to it in, in your browser. But if, you're, if you're using uh, Google Slides, you can already filter for that directly with inside um, Google Slides. So it's just going to go to the insert menu, uh, choose the picture option, type in what you're searching for, and all the images or icons that come up will already be uh, uh, Creative Commons license free. Hopefully that sort with that one. I've lost your audio, Flavia. You turn, turned yourself off, I think. Yeah, I muted myself. Uh, You're yeah. back. That sounds great. Uh, so 
there was a question about us from a Spanish teacher asking about office loans. Is there available in other languages? Will you read her Spanish writing? So immersive reader. Now, um, I don't know the answer to that. It's the short, it's the short answer. Um, however, I, there are lots of tools which are really useful within the Microsoft ecosystem. They've actually got a, um, a great tool which works within PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint uh, called the Microsoft Translator. And so a friend of mine is a head teacher at a school in Barcelona and lots of her parents don't really speak English. They've got a bit of broken English, but they're not you know, fluent English speakers. Mm -hmm. And obviously she presents, she presents in English. She's from Newcastle. She's like, well, I am then teaching like you're talking like, about what we're doing in my school. And, you know, with that going on, how can you know, a bunch of Spanish people yeah. um, know what she's saying? So if parents have got the Microsoft Translator app on their, on their devices, they can actually get a translation of what's being said and the things that are on the screen and all the rest of it at the same time simultaneously mm. fantastic tools great for inclusion all of that yeah. sort of stuff uh, so i do apologize i can't tell you about the immersive reader translation stuff right now but it's a very easy thing to do you know, google immersive reader uh, ask me on twitter and i can link you through to that and it, it's, it's only a quick um, thing to find out the answer yeah. uh, i'm yeah. sorry i don't know off the top of my head no, but um yeah there, there are lots of things for helping multilingual uh, students yeah. and I got some people I did, I did a show last week uh, around EAL and ESOL as well um, and um, they shared lots of, my guests shared lots of great tips and apps and things for the for supporting uh, students with um, uh, other languages so yeah yeah uh, so talking about parents or communication with parents uh, yeah. Miss Allen asked if there are any apps or technology that you would recommend to get in touch with parents or to keep them informed about school stuff something that really grates on me personally as I'm, I'm, I'm wearing my parent hat for a moment something yeah. that grates on me is when I get letters from school which are in a word format and I think to myself uh, Al Kingsley's just mentioned there oh, well done Al and thank you for joining us it was Al that I wrote the guide on digital strategy with he's a fantastic oh, gentleman you. thank you Al <laughs> um it really grinds on me when the school sends home a word document now word documents Sending home something like that assumes that every parent has access to Word so they open the documents and read it. Um, and don't get me wrong, sending stuff home from school is really important. Um, but there's a fantastic free tool available from um, Adobe called Adobe Spark. If you go to spark.adobe.com, yeah. um, and within there, there's, there's a suite of three tools in there, and one of them is called Adobe Spark Page. And it's a great tool. It makes a really beautiful web page. You don't need any, any sort of skill yourself in, in making the web page itself. It works a bit like Word, uh, and you just click in the bit where you want to drop some stuff in, and it just makes a beautiful page for you. You can fill it all in. I know loads of head teachers around the world now who use it as their weekly newsletter home, and all you've got to yeah. do when you finish is just hit the save button. It gives you a URL, and you just email the URL to parents, and then they can access that directly from within that. Yeah. Equally, though, there are other options and um, if you're a microsoft uh, school there's a great tool from microsoft called microsoft sway uh, which works in a very very similar way to adobe spark page um, but um, the, the key takeaway i think uh, i'd like you to take from my response to this question is whatever you choose to use and it could be a pdf it could be a web page and it could be a sway or whatever you know, web 2 tools are really useful but my key point on this would actually be to make sure whatever you choose to do to make it as accessible as possible yep uh, you don't know just, you, you don't yeah. you don't know what devices parents will have do you so you need to make it as open as possible so everyone can access the information that you're trying to share yeah i'm just going to say that a couple of weeks ago we had a speaker from the us and her whole talk was about adobe sparks so uh, was that Monica have, Burns by any chance? Yeah, it was Monica. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So a uh, huge advocate. Yeah, so I have the recording. So if anybody wants to see her explanation about how to use Adobe Sparks, just get in touch and I'll send you the video because she explains it very well, very easily. I'm using it now. I didn't know it before. And I'm using it. It's amazing. And, and, and whilst I talk about how easy it is to make um, things, you know, infographics and, and all yeah, these sorts of things. That's what I'm using them for. Keynotes, Adobe Spark Post, like I've been using it for years for keyword posters, for um, 
and resources, infographics, and it's super easy and it's completely free for education. If you go to the Adobe Spark for Education site uh, and sort of point your technicians in the direction yeah. of that, you can access that completely for free for your whole school. It is a fantastic offer. Um, and say Spark Video as well is an uh, amazing tool. My own nine year old son made my YouTube channel trailer video using Spark Video just last weekend. Um, it's a fantastic, fantastic yeah. Uh, yeah. suite of tools to use. Yeah. All right, so there was a question from Nikki Green, uh, also technical. Um, which of those apps would work on a Chromebook? Or all of them? Well, anything that would work in a browser yeah. will work on a Chromebook. Okay. Um, PowerPoint as a program on your device will not work. But if you go to office.com and log in with your Office 365 account, then you can use PowerPoint in the cloud. If you go to iCloud.com and log in with your Apple ID, then you can do things in Keynote. So long as you can do these things in your browser, then they work fine. Office Lens is a standalone app. So that's something that works on mobile devices. Um, it does work in Windows um, uh, um, as part of, uh, it has its own app and also works with inside things like uh, OneNote Class Notebook and OneNote, um, but it wouldn't work in, in a Chromebook. But Immersive Reader does. Immersive Reader mm -hmm. is something which is actually, you can use in browser um, and, and is a fantastic tool to use. And that'll work yeah. in Chrome, it'll work in Edge, it'll work in lots of different um, yeah. platforms. But the, the, the rule of thumb with that is if you've got a Chromebook, it has to work in browser. And if you've got something that works in browser, then it'll work on your Chromebook. Yeah. Um, we're almost out of time, uh, but there was a question here. I didn't write down the name of the person, sorry, but I thought it was an interesting one uh, about PowerPoint and using animations that you mentioned. Uh, what's the best way to make sure that they are helping learning and not being too distracting for the students or increasing cognitive load? And absolutely. And the same sort of thing is an issue with dual coding as well. Some people think dual coding is like just slapping 50,000 clip art images on your slides. And it's, it's absolutely not that. Um, it's about linking things through. The best thing of us I can give you with the animations is, uh, when I used to say, I, I, I used to work with a, a guy called Jim Smith, who's a lazy teacher. Um, and he wrote the Lazy Teacher's Handbook. And, and he's a real huge advocate for promoting student independent learning um, activities. And so I would often ask, based on his sort of recommendations, I would often ask my learners to create their own presentations to show their learning. But what would happen would be students would either copy and paste things, which obviously isn't, isn't very useful or helpful. And the other thing was they'd often spend more time making the text go naturally. So what I would think, the, the, the key thing I would say about doing animations in PowerPoint or whatever, whatever your tool is, because there are lots of different sort of presentation tools, keep it simple, make it focused on things where there are various steps. Okay, uh, so if you think, for example, I had that um, infographic that I've made where I was talking about the power of using Twitter. Okay, mm -hmm. and I had an icon, I had some text, yep. and I had a title. I didn't animate all of those separately. It didn't go. It didn't. It, it wasn't animated to the title, then the icon, then the text came in. I made it so all three things came in at the same time. That's going to be far better and less distracting than having boom, boom, boom. Having yep. boom as it were, it's far better. And then having that orders, so try and group them together. The yeah. next thing is try and use it when it's actually gonna be purposeful around a process that you're trying to explain. So that's, that's why I was showing, trying to show the maths example, because if you, if you just put all of it up, it's the same as any presentation when you give anything anywhere. Um, if, you, if you're delivering uh, um, some, you know, uh, 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 some slides to colleagues at school, don't put all of the bullet points up at the same time. If you wanna read through those bullet points, make those bullet points appear one at a time. So that, sorry, I'm using my so that thing again, but so that your learners aren't distracted by what's coming up. Yeah. Uh, but they can still see what they've seen before, but they, they, yeah. you, you introduce the topic or the thing you want to be discussing at the right time. And, and I tell you what, this is probably the simplest tip I'll share today, actually. But it's one I learned from uh, somebody uh, called Andy Hutt many years ago. If you are having a slide with a fair bit of text on and you want to... Um, um, often you, when you're bringing them in and you animate them you don't know you forget which yes. is the, the last bullet point you want to share don't put any punctuation on the end of any of your bullet points but on your very last bullet point put a full stop nobody will ever recognize it 
but you all know because you'll see that full stop. You all know that's mm. the end of your list, and you're ready to then move on to the next bit. That would be my top. That was a great simple tip Andy shared with me. I don't know, well over 10 years ago yeah. and uh, something I still do now so if you ever see me present again and you see a full stop at the end of a bulleted <laughs> list yeah, you'll sure. know you're about to move on to a new slide yeah that's yeah. great um well thank you Mark there are still a couple of other questions but we we only have two minutes left so I'm just gonna well one minute so I'm just gonna take that one minute to thank you again uh, so, that was brilliant that was really great uh, very very useful I'm sure everybody will have a lot of new things to try um tomorrow already uh, so can you please remind everybody of your uh, how to contact you please yeah absolutely uh, please do follow me at ICT evangelist on Twitter um, you can find my website um, ICT evangelist.com if you go to Pinterest YouTube LinkedIn Facebook and just type in the website slash ICT evangelist, uh, Instagram, so forth and so on, uh, then you're going to find me. I'm very easy to find. Uh, so please do stay in touch. Um, I've, I've shared some books, Perfect ICT Every Lesson, uh, with the guide that I wrote with Al, the guide to creating a digital strategy. It's really yeah. important to have something to actually hang all of these ideas off of and to do these things in a strategic way. And then other books as well, such as um, the Big Book of Independent Thinking and so forth and so on. But um, listen, just thank you so much, Flavor, for asking me to come and get involved we've been talking for a little while about doing this and, and uh, yeah. working together so thank you ever so much for the opportunity and, and also thank you to all these many many people who've given up their afternoon to come and hear uh, me sharing and, and uh, it's, it's, it's always very heartwarming to, sit, to hear people to yeah. hear what I've got to say so thank you ever so much for your time thank you no thank you okay and everybody I'll see you on Thursday we have the next one on Thursday 3 p.m hope to see you there and have an excellent day thank you Mark I'll see you on Twitter <laughs> Cheers. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.